There are some cases that stand out and shock the world. Whether tragic, mysterious, or unexplainable, they dive into the depths of human behavior and force us to see things we can't understand. The story of Elliot Rodger is one that still grips the world to this day and has gained global attention, striking a worldwide debate about the impact of mental health and radicalization in our online world. Welcome back to Ripshy Crime. This is the story of Elliot Roger and the events that led to a day the world would never forget. Elliot Roger was born on July 24th, 1991, in London, England, to parents Peter and Lee Chin Roger. Elliot was of mixed ethnicity, with his father being British and his mother of Chinese and Malaysian descent. Elliot's mother was a nurse who worked on film sets, like the one of Indiana Jones in The Last Crusade. His father, Peter, also worked in film, but as a television director, having worked on the set of the hit film The Hunger Games. Elliot had one younger sister, named Georgia. At the young age of five, Elliot and his family picked up their lives and moved to the United States, into a small suburban neighborhood in Los Angeles, California. Peter and Lee Chin had opportunities to work on bigger and more renowned film sets, and a chance in scenery was just what they thought they needed. According to his father, these were Elliot's best years. He was a young, adventurous boy. It was also the year that Elliot began his journey with a therapist, and his parents began to notice small issues in his life. Even in his early childhood days, he often claimed to feel overshadowed by his sister, who was an accomplished young gymnast, and often gained the attention of his parents. On the outside, it appeared as if Elliot and his family lived a quite prosperous life, but that was not entirely true. Even though he was often seen in designer clothes and luxury cars, his father was deeply in debt, and his mother made just enough money to support herself. Elliot quickly realized that there were hierarchies in this world, and that some people were just simply born into better, easier lives, or that others just seemingly lived better lives. And even though he was born into a loving and caring family, Elliot still felt like he was one of the people born into a disadvantage. On the outside, his life was comfortable, but to his family, it was known that Elliot had a lot of emotional issues. His parents divorced when he was just seven years old, and this affected him greatly. He grew up to have a very strained relationship with his stepmother, Suama Akabun, and he never became accustomed to his father remarrying someone. Into his early teenage years, Elliot experienced a lot of social difficulties. He didn't fit in easily at school, and he found it difficult to make and keep friends, especially with the girls his age. Elliot attended Crescipe Carmelite High School, an all-boys Catholic school in Encino, Los Angeles. When the school didn't work out and Elliot couldn't get along with the kids, he transferred to Taft High School in Woodland Hills. He left both of these schools after feeling severely bullied and eventually attended a tiny 100-student high school by the name of Independence Continuation High School in Lake Balboa. He graduated from here in 2009, but he still had no close friends and no idea what he wanted to do with his life. The one male friend that he did feel close to around his high school age apparently stopped speaking to him for no reason. Because of this, he had many feelings of inadequacy, which only amplified his sense of loneliness and resentment. Elliot became increasingly interested in girls and dating, but he had no luck. He couldn't form meaningful connections with girls, and rarely even boys, which led him to struggle with many feelings of isolation and frustration. Eventually, Elliot came to perceive himself as an outcast. To deal with these heavy feelings, he wrote extensively to himself about his loneliness in journals and diaries. In these entries, he wrote frequently about his feelings of rejection, by the time Elliot reached his 18th birthday, the shy young boy he once was no longer showed on the outside. He now presented himself as an adult full of anger and rage toward the world that he lived in. His parents noticed the hate that he held, and it even began to worry them about his abnormal behavior. After high school, Elliot's parents wanted him to move on to college, and they pushed him to enroll somewhere where he could move away and experience independence. Now at the University of California in Santa Barbara, this beautiful school sits on the coast of the Pacific Ocean with blue skies and more days of blue skies than not. 
They were sure this would help him come out of his shell and meet new friends that would eventually change his perception of life. Elliot only attended classes at the university for one year before eventually leaving. It was in Santa Barbara that Elliot began planning something against the world that he hated so much. He has said before that it was then where he began considering the possibility of carrying out some act of revenge to deal with the injustices he claimed to face every day. According to Elliot, these injustices he faced were at the hands of women. He was obsessed with losing his virginity in dating. His parents tried to console him, telling him that there was no shame in not losing your virginity at an early age, and that some people never even do. But this only made him angrier at the idea of not being found attractive by the women around him. He thought it was a crime for them to not take an interest in him, and still being a single virgin in his 20s angered him more than his friends and family could even comprehend. This is when Elliot began frequently visiting misogynist websites and joining online forums with other men who hated women just as much as he did. In one forum, he even shared a message that read, Start envisioning a world where women fear you. Elliot's parents were enraged when he shared these websites with them. His father, Peter, was particularly angry that Elliot took part in these groups, calling them evil and dark places that no one should ever visit. But his attempts to pull Elliot out of that world never worked, and they both failed to realize how deep his hatred ran and truly affected his entire life. This was all he could think about. In the summer of 2013, Elliot reached a boiling point. Just before attending a party with friends from school, he shared online that he was going to give women one more chance to help him lose his virginity before his birthday. But when the girls at the party ignored him, just as they had in the past, he grew increasingly angry to a point he could no longer control. He climbed onto a 10-foot ledge and pretended to shoot his peers with an imaginary gun for making him feel bullied and belittled. When Elliot continued to try and push various women off this ledge, a group of men intervened and shoved him off, causing him to break his ankle. But Elliot perceived this in a different way, or at least he told his parents a different story. According to Elliot, he was a poor victim of bullying and was called names and beaten up. He told the police the same story. According to him, he was always bullied by his peers, even though those at the party knew a different side of the story. Elliot refused to take the blame for his actions. According to Elliot's family and attorney, he had seen multiple therapists up until this point, starting when he was only a young child. He was bullied, according to him, all throughout his school years, and he even wrote later on that he often cried by himself as a child and developed an addiction to online gaming to the World of Warcraft. In one incident in his school years, he was apparently taped to a desk after falling asleep in class. To Elliot, this was just another example of how unfair and unkind the world could be to some people, even though they didn't deserve it, as he felt he did not. In 2011, at the age of only 20 years old, Elliot began drafting a manifesto that would eventually go on to make history. He began his story by speaking about the horrendous acts of those around him had committed against him while he was growing up. One such story claims he splashed hot coffee on two girls for not smiling at him while out in public, where he believed such a horrific act was justified for their impoliteness. In another entry from 2012, Elliot documents a time that he used a super soaker filled with orange juice to spray a group of teens playing kickball in his town. This is just another example of how feeling excluded made him disturbingly angry. In 2012, Elliot advanced from just the writing of his manifesto. He began plotting an attack against the world, in which he could make others finally realize that they were wrong to treat him so badly. In September of 2012, Elliot began visiting shooting ranges to practice firing handguns. In November of that year, he purchased his first ever handgun, a Glock 34 pistol. According to him, he chose this weapon because of its efficiency and high accuracy rate. And because he had no formal mental health diagnosis, he was able to illegally purchase a handgun in the state of California. Even though it was clear to those who knew him, he was too unstable to own such a weapon. Not long after this, he purchased two more handguns, later saying this was in case any of them had issues. 
According to Elliot, he had saved up around $6,000 to purchase weapons for the attacks he was planning on taking out in the future. Just over a year later, in early 2014, Elliot began formally planning his attack. He knew he wanted to do as much damage as he could in a short period of time. His goal is to make the world regret treating him so poorly, to make his peers regret bullying and excluding him while he was growing up, and most importantly, to make women regret not helping him lose his virginity. Elliot was willing to do whatever it took to avenge himself, and if this meant a massacre, he was prepared to do so. In his own words, Elliot began planning his retribution day. Between January and April of 2014, Elliot made two more firearms-related transactions, for purchases his family was utterly unaware of. In April of that same year, Elliot entered his most isolated period to date. Elliot's mother became worried after not hearing from him for a few days while he was living on his own. He had told her he was preparing to write a test, but he never reached back out to her and didn't answer her calls. On April 30th, she initiated a welfare check through his life coach to make sure he was not in trouble, but nothing came back as a result of this. According to statements, Elliot showed no signs of instability or that he may have been a danger to himself or others. But in fact, he displayed a near opposite, appearing calm and composed, which is another testament to his ability to act normal under some of the most high-stress situations. However, Elliot's mother did find his YouTube channel during the welfare investigation. She apparently notified the police, worried about what she saw her son sharing online and what it may cause him to do. On Elliot's YouTube, his mother found videos of him swearing off women and saying very hateful and scary things. Even though authorities did speak to Elliot about the videos, he allegedly said his mother was a worrier and that he only made the videos as a way to express himself because he was lonely and without many friends. But if his mother had been more persistent to have Elliot find the help he needed, she may have helped avoid what happened just days later. On May 23, 2014, Elliot sent an email to his therapist and family members containing a video from his public YouTube channel outlining what he was going to do. Extremely worried, his life coach and therapist called both of his parents to decide what they could do to stop him but it was already too late. In the video, Elliot goes into great depth about what he has planned for his retribution day. He has planned in detail how to cause harm to as many people as possible and to take revenge on the world that has always treated him so unfairly. In this eerie video that spread like wildfire on the internet, Elliot begins seated in his car. He opens with, well, this is my last video. It has all come to this. Then he goes on to say that he has planned to take revenge on humanity tomorrow, that he has spent years calculating his plan. Elliot speaks on his rage towards women for never giving him the affection or attention they gave to other men. He expressed a deep-seated hatred towards women, blaming them for his social isolation and lack of success with romantic relationships. Elliot says he has never even kissed a girl and is still angry about being a virgin at his age and that he will punish females for his crimes against him. Then he goes on to say that he is a superior one, the true alpha male, and that he will only not annihilate sorority girls, but also every other person on the streets of Isla Vista, the popular kids, the women, and the boys who bullied him. He finished his video by saying he hates everyone, calling humanity a disgusting species. In this video, Elliot also speaks directly at the camera, in a very frightening way, pointing to the people listening to threaten them directly. He says he hates sexually active men, and that he can't wait for the utter annihilation to come. The video ends, and then Elliot is now ready to take out his plan. Hi, Elliot Roger here. Well, this is my last video. It all has to come to this. Tomorrow is the day of retribution. The day in which I will have my revenge against humanity. Against all of you. For the last eight years of my life, ever since I've hit puberty, I've been forced to endure an existence of loneliness, 
rejection, and unfulfilled desires, all because girls have never been attracted to me. Girls gave their affection and sex and love to other men, but never to me. I'm 22 years old and I'm still a virgin. I've never even kissed a girl. I've been through college for two and a half years, more than that actually, and I'm still a virgin. It has been very torturous. College is the time when everyone experiences those things such as sex and fun and, and pleasure. But in those years I've had to rot in loneliness. It's not fair. You girls have never been attracted to me. I don't know why you girls aren't attracted to me, but I will punish you all for it. It's an injustice, a crime, because I don't know what you don't see in me. I'm the perfect guy. And yet you throw yourselves at all these obnoxious men instead of me, the supreme gentleman. I will punish all of you for it. <laughs> On the day of retribution, I am going to enter the hottest sorority house of UCSB. And I will slaughter every single spoiled, stuck-up, blonde slut I see inside there. All those girls that I've desired so much, they would have all rejected me and looked down upon me as an inferior man if I ever made a sexual advance towards them. While they throw themselves at these obnoxious brutes. I'll take great pleasure in slaughtering all of you. You will finally see that I am, in truth, the superior one. The true alpha male. <laughs> yes. After I've annihilated every single girl in the sorority house, I'll take to the streets of Isla Vista and slay every single person I see there. All those popular kids who live such lives of hedonistic pleasure while I've had to rot in loneliness for all these years. They've all looked down upon me every time I try to go out and join them. They've all treated me like a mouse. Well now, I will be a god compared to you. You will all be animals. You are animals, and I will slaughter you like animals. I'll be a god exacting my retribution and all those who deserve it and you do deserve it just for the crime of living a better life than me all you popular kids you've never accepted me and now you'll all pay for it on may 23rd 2014 he conducted attacks worse than anyone could ever imagined Around 9.15 p.m., Elliot went out to purchase a latte. Then he got in his car, weapons beside him, and drove back to the flat he shared with roommates. Moments before committing a treacherous act, he emailed his parents, life coach, friends, and others with his retribution video. This 107,000 word manifesto, titled, My Twisted World, the story of Elliot Roger, to a total of 34 people but it would be too late for them to intervene. And then, the rampage began. Elliot started at his house. He stabbed three of his own friends, two of which were his roommates, in their two-story courtyard building in Capri Apartments at 6598 Seville Road. 20-year-old Wai Han Wang and 20-year-old Chen Hong and 19-year-old George Chen, three University of California Santa Barbara students, all died of multiple stab wounds before Elliot went on his shooting rampage in Isla Vista, 
but their bodies wouldn't be found until after the rest of the damage was done. After beginning with his own friends, Elliot got into his car and drove to a place that may have been one of the stems of his anger, a sorority house. Just five blocks away from his apartment was the Alpha Phi house. After arriving, Elliot tried to get into the house, but the door was locked, and he stood outside banging on the door for more than a few minutes before realizing no one would let him inside. Having no time to waste, he was forced to move on. And frightened girls inside the house heard gunshots only moments later. After the first shots were fired, the first call to 911 was placed at 9.27 that night. This was only 12 minutes after visiting the coffee shop in the same area. Elliot's first gunshots were those aimed at the first females he saw outside the sorority house. Veronica Weiss and Catherine Cooper happened to be outside in the area, and while members watched from inside the house, he shot and killed both students out in the open. He shot at another woman multiple times as well, but she fortunately survived. Back in his car, Elliot was nowhere near stopping. He got back into his car and made a three-point turn into a driveway on Pardell Road, nearby another coffee shop. It was closed at the time, but he fired three shots inside on his way past. Just two blocks, three minutes later, at a deli on the same street, Elliot exited his vehicle. Here, he fatally shot 20-year-old Christopher Armtonez, another student from the university. But this time, four cops on foot saw the shots being fired and also saw Elliot flee the scene again in his black BMW. Now back in his car, he continued driving and firing gunshots at innocent bystanders. Then he turned south on El Embarcadero and east onto Del Playa, brandishing the gun at a woman there. He then headed west on Del Playa and fired at the officers on foot attempting to stop him. They returned fire, but Elliot drove away. At this point, Elliot was fully set into his attack, and there was no turning back. Speeding through the streets of his own neighborhood, he hit a bicyclist with his car and didn't pause for a second, continuing rounds of ammunition out of his driver's side window. Near the junction of Embarcadero, Del Norte, and Madrid Road, he swerved to hit a man, Jin Fu, who was just crossing the road. The attack went on and on with no end in sight. People from all across the town had no ability to stop his hideous actions. He just continued to fire as he drove, including hitting three more female pedestrians he drove past, and another victim on the side of Sabado Tarde. Finally, at 9.33pm, just 10 minutes after causing complete chaos in the area, he came into contact with four police officers. As they shot at each other, with Elliot attempting to fatally shoot them, he was hit with one of the returning bullets. He was injured, but not stopped. Still in his car, Elliot turned back onto El Embarcadero, hitting another bicyclist on the street. Elliot then crashed into cars in his way, while officers were still in pursuit. After the accident, he could no longer flee. Officers rushed to his car to pull him out and handcuff him, but it was too late. Elliot had already taken his own life before anyone could face him to face the facts of the damage that he had already caused and the lives that he had already taken. Inside Elliot's car, more than 500 rounds of live ammunition were found, as well as another pistol and two knives. The attack was finally over, but the effects of the aftermath were just beginning. The people of Isla Vista were in a panic and emergency services were in full effect to try and save as many lives as they could. Elliot took six lives that day, not including his own, and he injured at least a dozen more people, changing their lives forever. In the days following the attack, community and family members felt the terror brought on by Elliot. Many of them had lost friends or family members and even more witnessed what happened that night. Students and community members held services to mourn together including one at a park in Isla Vista on the night of May 24th, where they joined for a candlelit memorial in memory of all the lives that Elliot costed them. More than 20,000 people attended a memorial at the university's Harder Stadium on May 27th. His parents, Peter Roger and Lee Chin Roger, faced immense shock, grief, and public scrutiny. 
In the immediate aftermath of the tragic events, they released a statement expressing their profound sadness for the loss of the innocent lives and the injuries caused by their son's violent actions. They also conveyed their sympathy and condolences to the victims' families. As the news of the massacre spread, Elliot Rogers' parents became the subject of media attention and scrutiny. Many questioned if there were any warning signs or red flags that could have been missed, and debates arose concerning gun control, mental health awareness, and misogyny in society. In the aftermath of the tragedy, Peter and Lee Chen Roger cooperated with law enforcement and investigators, providing whatever assistance they could in understanding their son's actions and motives. They were deeply affected by the loss of innocent lives and shared in the public's sense of shock and grief. Since the massacre, members of the community have spoken out about Elliot in an attempt to stop massacres like this from happening again and help those feeling isolated to get the help they need before such extreme actions are taken. As part of the ongoing investigation into his life, Elliot's apartment was searched by investigators. Inside, they found several more knives, including a 10-inch zombie killer blade and an 18-inch machete. Also inside his apartment was a printed-out version of his manifesto and his diary in which the last sentence reads, This is it. In one hour, I will have my revenge on this cruel world. Another crucial part of the investigation was into his online presence. Authorities analyzed his virtual trace to better understand his motives and intentions. This tragedy led to a greater understanding of the importance of recognizing the warning signs of isolation and possibly even mental illness. This case sparked national news. Topics of misogyny, mental health, and the dangers of online radicalization were now seen as important topics to speak to young adults about. Parents were careful to be more involved in their children's lives, and the dangers of the online world were taken more seriously. It also brought attention to the issue of gun violence and the need for better mental health support and intervention. In regard to the manifesto, Elliot's father was actually aware he was writing it before the attacks. He claimed to have been unaware of the subject matter, though, or of the seriousness of it. According to him, he asked Elliot more than once if he could read it, and Elliot told him he would be able to read it soon enough. Ultimately, the Elliot Roger case remains a stark reminder of the potential consequences of untreated mental health issues and the devastating impact of misogyny and hatred. It serves as a call to action for society to address these underlying issues and work towards creating a safer and more inclusive environment for all.